Hello friends, Steve Stockton here with you. Welcome to episode number 19 of our Strangest Unsolved National Park Disappearances series, where we present 10 more cases for you to ponder. Join us. Let's walk and see. In the United States National Park System alone, there are more than 84 million acres of preserved woods, deserts, mountains, and other wilderness. So, it's no surprise that in the past hundred years or so, there have been a lot of people reported missing in these national parks and forests. But what's truly disturbing is these numbers seem to be increasing. Now, that could be because we're just more aware of it because the internet has made the world smaller. Those of us in this community know that sometimes the circumstances behind these disappearances, though, can be beyond bizarre. In this video, we'll discuss 10 more unsolved national park disappearances. Please note that some of these cases have very limited information, but we will do our best to keep you updated of any new developments in future episodes. With that said, let's begin. Number 10, Timothy Philpott. 50-year-old Timothy Philpott was last seen at 7.45 a.m. in Ellsworth, Maine on January 12, 2016. After this, his movements are unknown and this would be the last confirmed sighting of Timothy. For reasons that are unknown, Timothy made his way into the Acadia National Park in Maine and simply vanished. Officials do not believe that Timothy went hiking or skiing and have not offered any explanation as to why he was in the park. It wasn't until the following day, January 13, 2016, that the park rangers noticed his car was still in the Parkman Mountain parking lot, just off Maine Route 198 in Mount Desert. Park rangers had noticed the car the day before and found it odd that its owner still hadn't returned. A quick search of the area was conducted, but no sign of Timothy was found. According to the National Park Service file on Timothy, the Acadia National Park Service also attempted to contact him by telephone. However, when this was unsuccessful, they began a wider search and rescue operation. With Timothy failing to have made contact with the park rangers, it was clear that something was wrong. By January 14, 2016, the Mount Desert Search and Rescue, Maine Warden Service, and the Acadia National Park Service began their official search for him. Volunteers on the ground, as well as helicopters, were used in the search for Timothy, with the copters scanning through various areas of the park, looking for any sign of the man. By the second day of the search, the Maine Association of Search and Rescue and Maine Search and Rescue Dogs had also joined in the operation, but unfortunately, there was just no sign of Timothy. According to articles, large snowstorms severely hampered their searches, and with this snow came increased concerns about Timothy's welfare. With the bitter Maine weather rolling in throughout most of January and February, search and rescue teams were forced to wait until the snow had subsided, but even then, they were unable to find any sign of Timothy. Months passed without any word, but then, as the sun slowly began to shine again, the horrific news came. In mid-April 2016, the National Park Service gave the following statement to the media saying, on Friday morning, April 15, 2016, three members of Maine Search and Rescue Dogs using three trained search dogs were searching an area of the park that had not been covered. At approximately 11 a.m., one of the search dogs alerted on a backpack that was found 40 feet down slope from the Around Mountain Carriage Road in a heavily forested area. The other two search dog teams moved to this location to broaden the search. At approximately 2.45 p.m., a search dog alerted on human remains which were located 170 feet downslope from the location of the backpack. Now, a few days after this press release, the main office of the chief medical examiner announced that the remains belonged to missing 50-year-old Timothy Philpott. The medical examiner has never released cause of death, and all articles surrounding Timothy's disappearance state that the results are pending. The only comment that has been made is by the Acadia National Park staff representative John Kelly, told the Mount Desert Islander in April 2016, quote, we're not commenting on the condition of the body. The location would not been conducive to a fall because it's forested. It's not a precipice. If someone fell from the carriage road, they would have hit a tree and stopped, end quote. Timothy's obituary reads, Tim was an avid hiker and enjoyed fishing and other outdoor activities and sports. He is very loved and will be greatly missed by all who knew him. His family also added that, in lieu of flowers, they were asking for donations to the Acadia National Park. Timothy, rest in peace, my friend. Number 9. Joshua Jacobson 
When 39-year-old Joshua Jacobson failed to make contact with his family in mid-July 2015, his family knew something had gone wrong. On July 16th of that year, Joshua was officially reported missing and the search for him immediately began. Investigators discovered that Joshua had likely entered the Badlands National Park in southwestern South Dakota on July 12, 2015. Joshua's mother would later recall to the Norfolk Daily News how she often joked that he seemed incapable of staying in the same place for too long. Just a month before his disappearance, Joshua had left Lincoln for Norfolk, Nebraska, chasing a new job as a chef at the Claremont Steak and Chop House. He had recently completed his culinary arts degree at the Southeast Community College, and he appeared to be excited about the future. Joshua was interested in soul-searching and was always looking to improve himself one way or another. His girlfriend, Darla Darnell, told the Norfolk Daily News he'd see opportunities and think maybe that's something better. He was always striving for more experience, more information, to take him to a different level. So, when Joshua announced that he was going on a vision quest in the Badlands National Park, nobody batted an eyelid. These kinds of soul-searching missions were not out of the ordinary for Joshua, who deeply admired Native American traditions and customs and was always looking to connect deeper with the spirit and nature herself. On July 12, 2015, Joshua said goodbye to his girlfriend and his family, with none of them knowing it would be the last time. Joshua had intended on going on a vision quest following his 39th birthday, but unfortunately, Joshua would not make it out of the Badlands National Park alive. Joshua didn't speak much to his family about the details of his vision quest, although his girlfriend would later give investigators a vital clue. According to the Norfolk Daily News, Darla believed that he had modeled his quest after the Lakota Himbosia, which translates to crying for a dream. Traditionally, it's a rite of passage rooted in self-sacrifice, the vision seeker deprived of food, water, and sleep over the course of several days. However, by July 16th, Joshua still had made contact with his friends and family after entering the park, and that was when they knew something was off. On July 15th, 2015, a day before Joshua was reported missing, Darnell left a message with the Badlands National Park Service, and as she awoke for the next morning, she discovered that he had been reported missing. For Darla and Joshua's family, the entire event played out like a nightmare. Within hours of the report being filed, park rangers and search and rescue teams had entered the park looking for any sign of Joshua. On the second day of the search, July 17, 2015, a troubling clue had been discovered. Abandoned at the edge of the Sage Creek Wilderness area, searchers found Joshua's Dodge pickup and, according to reports, there was no sign he had made camp. His friends and family watched on as the search continued. Each day, new volunteers and search and rescue personnel poured into the park. The searchers were joined by a military helicopter and dog units, but still, no sign of Joshua could be found. The search for Joshua continued throughout the week, and by July 20th, 2015, the authorities had made the difficult decision to scale back the search. While the major efforts were scaled back, park officials and volunteers continued to work with Joshua's family to find him until the search was officially suspended on August 4th. Months passed without any updates, and then on September 15th, 2015, Joshua's name would make the headlines once again, but for a very somber reason. After the search was suspended on August 4th, the effort was picked up again on September 15th when searchers found Joshua's backpack close to the Sage Creek Wilderness area where his car had been found abandoned all those months ago. Sadly, just a day later on September 16th, park rangers found Joshua's body in a dry creek bed at the bottom of a ravine. His family were notified and a positive identification was made by the coroner some days later. According to official reports, there was no signs of trauma, ruling out foul play, but the cause of his death remains unknown. The coroner has not commented whether the state of Joshua's body factored in the inability to uncover his cause of death, or whether there were other factors that prevented them from determining or disclosing the cause of death. Joshua's girlfriend, Darla Darnell, told KLKN-TV, I do really miss him, quite a bit, and I still love him, and I always will. They found him on his mother's birthday. So it's been very difficult, and I know how I feel, but I can't imagine how it's affecting them. Joshua, rest in peace. Number 8. Mark Young Jr. 21-year-old Mark Young Jr. was just beginning to flourish into adulthood. He was studying political science at the University of Northern Colorado, and by all accounts was a normal student. 
His father, Mark Young Sr., told the Montrose Press he was always, in recent years, very disturbed about the whole global situation and problems. Lately, he was concerned about water for third world countries, and he just seemed to carry this huge burden on his shoulders about these global issues that just really troubled him. He let these big issues get to him that no one has the ability to change, but he seemed to think he was going to change things. Mark was dedicated to world issues and politics, so when he failed to turn up to his constitutional history class on September 16, 2008, one of his classmates and his roommate began the search for him. The two searched in and around Greeley, looking for any sign of Mark, but when their search failed, they knew they needed to contact Mark Sr. and let him know that his son was missing. Mark Sr. is a Civil Air Patrol pilot and a member of the Montrose County Sheriff's Posse, so he used those connections to kickstart the search for his son. Within hours of Mark being made aware that his son was missing, he had contacted Mark Jr.'s phone provider, AT&T, to obtain his call records. According to a Montrose Press article written in September of 2008, Mark Jr. made a voicemail check in the Bailey area on September 16th, the day that he disappeared. This quickly led Mark Sr. and the search party to Bailey, but there was one problem. AT&T later told Mark Sr. that after the voicemail check had been made, Mark Jr. sent a text message from the Montrose County area, which led the search party back there. Mark Sr. later told the Montrose Press, What they failed to tell me, there was also a text message that was sent later in the day from Flat Top Tower. AT&T admitted a text message had been sent. That completely changed the search area. Originally, they didn't bother to tell me about the text message. Mark Jr.'s friends were incredibly cooperative in the search for him, and a friend told Mark Sr. that he had received the message. The contents of this message, though, have never been disclosed. Mark Sr. and the search crew continued through the night and into the next few days, searching every corner of Montrose County, hoping to find Mark Jr. By September 18th, the crew had turned their attention to the Black Canyon of Gunnison National Park, and it's not known whether their search naturally progressed there or whether the crew received a tip to search the park. Shortly into their search, Mark Sr. found his son's truck at the Chasm View Overlook on the south rim of the park. A ticket confirmed that Mark Jr. had entered the Black Canyon of the Gunnison National Park at around 5 p.m. on Tuesday, September 16, 2008. There was no indication made as to why Mark Jr. may have entered the park. With the discovery of his son's car, though, Mark Sr. knew that he was getting closer to finding his son. His mind raced with hundreds of thoughts, and he hoped and prayed that he would find Mark Jr. safe and well. Unfortunately, just six hours after Mark's truck was discovered, his body was found below a rim in the Chasm View area. As night had almost fallen, the recovery effort was postponed until the following day, September 19th, when park ranger Angie Richmond hiked to the rim and recovered Mark Jr.'s body with the assistance of a helicopter. The National Park Service made a press release on September 18, 2008 in regards to the discovery of Mark Jr.'s body, and in their release, they noted Chasm View is a popular overlook along the scenic drive on the south rim of Black Canyon. The overlook is 1,820 feet above the Gunnison River and looks across the narrowest part of the canyon. Mark Jr.'s body was removed and transported to the Montrose County Coroner's Office, where Dr. Thomas Canfield performed an autopsy and determined that the remains did indeed belong to Mark Jr. Unfortunately, Mark's cause of death has either never been determined or never been released to the public, and what happened to him remains a mystery. There are very few articles about Mark Jr.'s disappearance, and those articles that do exist are from 2008. Mark Sr. later went on to thank the efforts of everyone involved in the search for his son and told the Montrose Press, You're not supposed to have to bury your child. We're all doing the best we can do. Mark Jr., rest in peace, friend. Number seven, Nancy Wilcox. Now, Ted Bundy is a man who needs no introduction in this community, and his crimes could warrant a full video of their own. Well, everyone knows Ted's name and recognizes him for his disgusting charm and decision to represent himself in court. Nobody knows the names of his victims. For far too long, the names and lives of the young women whose lives he stole have been forgotten and buried underneath the plethora of sensationalism around Bundy himself. It's almost a cult of personality. It's time that we remember the women whose lives were taken, and that is why we're bringing you the story of 16-year-old Nancy Wilcox. Nancy was your typical 16-year-old girl, 
She lived in Holiday, Utah with her family and picked up a job at an Arctic Circle drive-in as a waitress when she wasn't attending Olympus High School. Nancy was a cheerleader and was popular amongst her friends, and in the months before she disappeared, she told her cousin something that would chill investigators years later. Her cousin, Jamie Hayden, later told investigators that Nancy confided in her that an older man who was attending law school had been visiting Nancy's work. It appears that the two had likely struck up a conversation in a few times, and Susie, Nancy's sister, would also disclose that on a few occasions, this unknown man had driven past their house. One article about Nancy's disappearance has suggested that this mysterious man may have been indeed Ted Bundy. At the time of Nancy's disappearance in October of 1974, Bundy was living in Salt Lake City where he was attending the University of Utah School of Law. We all know that Bundy loved young brunette women and with her thick, dark hair, Nancy would have certainly stood out to him. Had Ted been prowling throughout Halliday and had begun grooming Nancy? Life for the Wilcox carried on as usual, day in, day out. That was until October 2nd, 1974, the day that would turn their lives upside down and send them into a dark spiral for the pursuit of truth and justice. On October 2nd, Nancy left her home at 2409 Arnett Drive for what would be the last time. According to multiple sources, Nancy headed to school and a little later on in the day, she left school to go and purchase some chewing gum. Nancy left the safe grounds of Olympus High School was last seen by her fellow students in the passenger seat of a yellow Volkswagen Bug. This was the last time the 16-year-old Nancy Wilcox was ever seen, and it would take the Holiday Police Department, now the Unified Police Department, several months to even begin the search for her. When she failed to return home from school, her parents did contact the police. However, both parties agreed that perhaps the young girl had likely run away. Nancy's sister, Susie, would later tell YouTuber Captain Borax that on the day of her disappearance, Nancy had gotten into an argument with her dad and had left the house. With this in mind, and this being the 1970s, Nancy was ruled a runaway, and very few efforts were made to find her in those initial hours and even days following her disappearance. In fact, it wasn't until December 1974 that the police even made Nancy's disappearance public and began to take her case seriously. This only came after another young woman disappeared and several more had been found murdered. It's unacceptable that it took the disappearance and murder of several more young women for any of their cases to be taken seriously. And it's likely that vital evidence in all the cases was lost due to the inaction of investigators. As the days and weeks passed without word from their daughter, the Wilcox began to worry that something terrible had happened to her. Weeks quickly turned into months, which slowly turned into years and the Wilcox had no news of their daughter's disappearance. Her friends and family spoke with investigators, but despite this, nobody could find anything to suggest where she may have gone, why she may have left, or what could have happened to her. For the Wilcox family, the next 15 years would be filled with agony and sorrow, wondering if their beloved daughter had started a new life somewhere else or whether the unthinkable might have happened to her. Of course, her siblings never forgot about her, and her sister, Susie, has been her biggest advocate. The Wilcox waited and waited, hoping for some news from the local police department. And then in 1989, a new lead would come from the unlikeliest of sources. Ted Bundy had been found guilty and was sentenced and was awaiting his fate. And as he paced up and down his death row cell, he began to go through his list of victims and decided that it was time to tell the truth. Bundy confessed to having been responsible for Nancy's disappearance and told prison officials that he had buried her body somewhere in or near the Capitol Reef National Park. Maintaining the last shred of control he had over his victims, Bundy claimed that he wasn't sure of the exact spot. While Nancy's family felt like they finally had some answers, they now had to find her body and find out whether Bundy was telling the truth. Unfortunately, Nancy's remains have never been found, and Bundy's confession and the eyewitness accounts of Nancy in the yellow Volkswagen are the only pieces of evidence to connect her to this case. There was one possible sighting of Nancy that puts her in Lake Point, Utah. The waitress came forward after her disappearance was made public, telling investigators that she had seen Nancy in the company of a man with a mustache, and that the two had left in a light-colored Volkswagen. Now, it's never been confirmed whether this sighting was of Nancy, and if it was, we don't know for sure that the man with her was Bundy. 
If Nancy's disappearance had been made public in the days after she disappeared, this clue may have led them to Nancy and her family would finally have some answers. The Capitol Reef National Park is over 200 miles away from where Nancy lived in Utah, and Bundy claimed before his passing that Nancy had never been in his car. Bundy gave multiple different accounts of what happened, though, sometimes speaking in third person in order to distance himself from his crimes. If Nancy had never gotten in Bundy's car, how'd she gotten over 200 miles away to the Capitol Reef National Park? Bundy's accounts wildly differ, and it seems that Bundy himself was incapable of getting his own story straight. As it stands today, Nancy Wilcox is still missing, and her sister, Susie, continues to fight for justice on her behalf. It's believed that Bundy knew where Nancy was buried, but wanted to exercise, like we said, that last shred of control he had over her by keeping her final resting place a secret that only he knew. Nancy Wilcox would be 63 today, if still alive. She's described as a white female with brownish blonde hair, brown eyes, stood five feet six inches tall, weighing 120 pounds. She was last seen wearing a new coat, a size nine dress, size six and a half shoes. If you have any information about Nancy's disappearance, you're asked to contact the Unified Police Department of Greater Salt Lake City at 385-468-9800 and reference case number 74-54455. Number 4. Robert Stewart Pluta and Robert Neil Pluta 57-year-old Robert Stewart Pluta and 21-year-old Robert Neil Pluta had a close father-son relationship. Robert Sr. and Jr. loved nothing more than hiking and traveling through the great outdoors. So over Father's Day weekend in 2017, the pair decided to head to the Carlsbad Caverns National Park in New Mexico. The two planned to get a hotel and hike around the park, spending valuable time bonding together. Unfortunately, this would be the last trip they would ever take, and just weeks later, their family's lives would be turned upside down. Over the weekend of the 10th in June of 2017, Robert Sr. and Jr. left their homes in Corpus Christi, Texas and headed for the park. It's unknown exactly which day the two left and we know that the two headed into the park sometime that weekend. While the Father's Day celebration continued, Lillian, the wife and mother of the two Roberts respectively, wondered what they were getting up to and what photographs they would have to show her when they returned. The days went by and Lillian excitedly counted down the days. But on June 14, 2017, she received a troubling phone call. Robert Sr. and Robert Jr. had booked a room at the Fairfield Inn to give them a base camp during their hikes. When Lillian answered the phone, she was met by the reception desk of the Fairfield Inn, telling her that her husband and son had failed to check out. This was when Lillian knew something was deeply wrong, and she contacted authorities. Bank records were searched, and the last transaction was made at around 12 p.m. that day according to the Carlsbad Current Argus, and calls to their cell phone over the next few days went straight to voicemail. Lillian and the rest of the family desperately tried to get in contact with the two Roberts, hoping that one of them would answer. Lillian had alerted the authorities to the two men's disappearance, and within hours, a search and rescue team had assembled and was on the lookout for the pair. With temperatures rising in the park, time was against them. On June 19th, searchers, investigators, and officers entered the park once more, looking for any sign of the men. After a short search, they found the red Ford F-150 truck that the two had been traveling in abandoned near the Rattlesnake Canyon trailhead. There was no evidence in the car to indicate where the two men had gone or what could have happened, but the discovery of the vehicle did help to expand the search radius. In total, the New Mexico State Police, the National Park Service, New Mexico State Search and Rescue, Mesilla Valley Search and Rescue, Oregon Mountain Technical Rescue, the Eddy County Fire Service, the U.S. Forest Service, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, and the Native Air Ambulance all turned up to help find Robert Sr. and Jr. Unfortunately, shortly after their car was discovered, Robert Jr.'s body would be found at around 10 p.m., bringing the effort to a screeching halt. His body was discovered just two miles northwest of the caverns. It wouldn't be until the next morning at around 10 a.m. that Robert Sr.'s body would be discovered just a mile away from where his son was found. Their families were sadly informed, and the news devastated them understandably. 
Robert Sr. and Jr. were avid hikers, and their families found it hard to imagine how the two had encountered trouble out in the park. The bodies were transported to the coroner's office, who identified the two men, and later declared that the two had died due to heat exposure. Vina Singe, the coroner in charge of the autopsies, wrote in their report, quote, No naturally occurring water sources in the area could have provided relief, and both hydration packs carried by the men were empty, end quote. Singe relayed that hydration packs, water, and SPF are vital when being outdoors in temperatures that were in the range they were that day. An exact date of death has never been publicized, and Singe commented that it could have taken them days to perish. The investigation is now officially closed, and their families are now left wondering how two avid hikers found themselves in this perilous situation. Our thoughts and prayers go out to the family. Darren Dixon 20-year-old Darren Dixon of Muncie, Indiana, was a bright and promising young man with a great future ahead of him. After graduating from Burris High School, Darren enrolled at Taylor University in Upland, Indiana, and was looking ahead to the future. When he wasn't studying hard towards his degree, Darren worked in the Yellowstone National Park in Montana as a busboy at the Roosevelt Lodge. Darren usually worked here during the long summer breaks, and the job gave him extra cash to see him through college. By 1993, Darren was in his second year of employment at the lodge and showed no signs of trouble or dislike of his job. But that all changed on July 2nd, 1993, when without warning, Darren quit his job. His employer and his colleagues were stunned. Darren had always been a good worker and gave no reason as to why he was quitting. He handed in his uniform, and that was the last time that anyone at the Roosevelt Lodge would ever see him. July 4th, 1993, American Independence Day, will be the last time that Darren was ever seen. According to the Charlie Project, Darren was seen in the Yellowstone National Park in Montana. No further details about his disappearance are available. When he failed to make contact with friends and family, the authorities were alerted and the search for the 20-year-old began. The only evidence found was Darren's car, which was located at the Lamar River Canyon pullout in the Yellowstone National Park, along with his wallet and other items that were found inside the car. Search and rescue crews, along with investigators, scoured Yellowstone National Park, but even now, almost 30 years later, there's been no sign of Darren. Did Darren meet with foul play? Did he have an accident? Or is there something darker going on in the National Park? Darren Dixon was last seen on July 4, 1993, in the Yellowstone National Park. He's described as a white male with brown hair, brown eyes, stood six foot one inches tall and weighed 170 pounds. Darren has a tooth mark scar on his head and a one inch scar on his knee. He was last seen wearing a white long sleeve t-shirt with blue jeans and hiking boots. Anyone with information is asked to please contact the Yellowstone National Park Service at 307-344-2640 or the Wyoming Division of Criminal Investigation at 307-777-7181. Next, we have Dennis Eugene Johnson. Unfortunately, this is one of those cases where there are very few details available. Dennis Eugene Johnson, little eight-year-old boy, very typical. He loved to be in the great outdoors, and his father had made sure to teach Dennis basic yet vital survival skills. The Johnsons lived in Inyo Kern, California, and in early April 1966, the family packed their suitcases and went on vacation to the Yellowstone National Park in the Wyoming side. Dennis was thrilled about the upcoming trip, and he daydreamed about all the open spaces that he could explore. Sadly, what should have been a wonderful experience for the little boy quickly morphed into a tragedy. On April 12, 1966, the Johnsons were on a hike and had stopped for a quick rest at the Cascade Picnic area. As the parents' backs were turned, but for a moment, Dennis' seven-year-old sister Mary had disappeared somewhere in the wilderness. Knowing she couldn't have gone far, Dennis and his father agreed to split up and search for her. Some sources even mentioned that Dennis was the one to sound the alarm that his sister was missing, showing his caring and attentive nature. Dennis knew basic survival skills and how to navigate in the great outdoors, so his father wasn't too worried about his son. As the Johnsons walked through the trees, shouting their daughter's name, they quickly came across her and headed back to the spot where they were taking a break previously. The only problem was, now Dennis was missing. Once again, the Johnsons were back to shouting, this time looking for their son. They searched high and low, calling out Dennis' name, but he was simply gone, 
Seconds felt like hours for the Johnsons as they desperately searched for their son, and after some time had elapsed, they knew that something was very, very wrong and immediately summoned a park ranger. Soon, 50 people, including volunteers and search and rescue units, had flooded into the picnic area, trying to find any sign of Dennis. For two weeks, the Johnsons and volunteers combed the picnic area, and eventually, their search had expanded to cover over 12 miles. Despite this Herculean effort for the community and authorities, no sign of little Dennis Johnson was ever found. There were no footprints, no clothes, nothing to suggest what might have happened to him. The Charlie Project interestingly notes that Dennis may have gotten lost and perished due to low temperatures and lack of food and water, but it's also possible that he was kidnapped. With no evidence to point either way, all we can do is speculate. The 56th anniversary of Dennis' disappearance has just passed, and his family are still no closer to finding out what happened to their little son. Dennis Johnson was last seen at around 1.30 p.m. in the Cascade Picnic area of the Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming. He was described as a white male child with sandy blonde hair, brown eyes, and would be 64 years old if still alive today. He has a six-inch scar on his abdomen that runs through his navel. He was last seen wearing a dark red or magenta long sleeve shirt, tan Levi's pants, and size 8 laced moccasin style hiking boots with crepe soles. Anyone with any information is asked to contact Daniel Kirshner of the National Park Service at 307 344 2122. Next, Timothy Joseph Lynch. In June 2003, 44 year old Timothy Joseph Lynch booked himself a well earned holiday to Hawaii. The vacation will make a nice change of scenery from Newburgh, Indiana. Timothy wanted to visit the Hawaii Volcanoes National Park to take in the beautiful surroundings and take some photos. As Timothy's vacation drew to a close, other passengers shuffled into the gate, scanning their boarding passes and preparing to fly back home. But Timothy was nowhere to be seen. His estranged wife, Tamara Lynch, had learned that Timothy had failed to show up at Bueller's Bilo that he managed and knew that something was wrong. After learning this, Tamara reported her estranged husband missing and went to his house in Newburgh to look for any sign of him. As she entered the home they once shared, she saw that the answering machine was beeping with bright lights alerting to unread messages. As she picked up the phone and dialed the code to the answering machine, she was shocked to hear a message from the hotel, the Royal Kona Resort, where he had been staying. In the voicemail, the reception of the hotel asked Timothy when he was going to check out and when he was going to pay the bill. This message sent alarm bells ringing for Tamara and the authorities who quickly contacted the Hawaii County Police Department to notify them of the situation. Investigators began checking into the details of Timothy's holiday and found that he had last been seen on June 6, 2003 at the end of Chain of Craters Road in the Hawaii National Park. Witnesses saw him hiking and taking photos and after this there were no more sightings. Investigators were baffled and they began searching the park by foot and air. Unfortunately, despite their best efforts, no sign of Timothy has ever been found. Timothy left everything behind in his room at the Royal Kona Resort. All signs pointed to Timothy still being in Hawaii. So where was he and what happened to him? During his trip, Timothy had rented a car, which was later found in the Hawaii Volcano's parking lot. And again, the rental car yielded no clues. A year after his disappearance, his estranged wife, Tamara, positioned the court to have Timothy declared legally deceased, although his family were not on board with this proceeding. In 2004, the Star Bulletin reported that Robert Lynch, Timothy's father, had his own theories and suspicions about what happened to his son. As reported by the Star Bulletin, which is now available online thanks to archives, Robert Lynch said he thinks their son either planned his own disappearance because of his dirty divorce or he met with foul play by someone who stole his identity and then traveled to Hawaii to fake his death. Robert told the Star Bulletin, quote, It seems odd to me, and also to just about everybody else, that he would take his ticket and his travel orders with him from the hotel on a side trip. Every day, we pray for some wisdom to find him, to know where he is, how he is, what he is. If we knew he passed on, it would be a relief. But every day we live with this, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, end quote. Timothy Lynch is described as a white male with brown hair and brown eyes, standing five foot eight inches tall and weighing 180 pounds. Timothy is listed as having a dark complexion and a muscular build. He has a surgical scar in his abdomen and a light brown abrasion scar on his lower back. 
He was last seen wearing gray and silver hiking shoes and carrying a black shoulder bag. Timothy may have also styled his facial hair in a goatee. Anyone with any information is asked to please contact the Warwick County Sheriff's Department in Indiana at 812-897-6180 and reference case 03-1531 or the Hawaii County Police Department at 808-935-3311. Number 2. John Paul Squires 71-year-old John Paul Squires was last seen rafting on American Creek in the Katmai National Park in Alaska on June 20, 2018. There are very few reports about John's disappearance, but we do know that on the day of his disappearance, John was out rafting with two friends and that the three of them had traveled from their home in California to Alaska. Each year, the three friends would make the journey through the U.S.-Canada border and back into Alaska for their annual fishing trip. It was a trip the three men looked forward to, giving them a peaceful escape away from their hectic lives, and it was a good chance for the friends to catch up with each other. The National Park Service reported in their press release about John's disappearance that Squires was last seen rafting the American Creek in Katmai National Park, Alaska, when the raft he was in hit a sweeper, throwing him and the other occupants on board into the fast-flowing creek. He was last seen swimming downriver, attempting to reach the shoreline. At the time of the friend's annual trip, the waters had been especially high and rocky, but they decided to go rafting anyway. Unfortunately, and for reasons unknown, John was not wearing a life jacket, and the fast current of the water swept him away from his friends, and sadly all they could do was watch on as he attempted to swim to safety. Luckily, his two friends made it to shore and were later assisted, but John has never been seen or heard from since. Authorities believe that John drowned, however, his family and friends are desperate for solid answers as to what happened to their loved one. John Paul Squires is described as a white male with brown hair, blue eyes, standing 5 foot 8 inches tall and weighing 195 pounds. John may have been sporting a gray mustache and also has a tattoo on his left forearm of a wilderness scene with a river, mountains, and a flying raven. He was last seen wearing a brown down vest, gray Patagonia waders, and river sandals. Anyone with any information is asked to contact Malia Miller of the Alaska State Troopers at 907-269-5511 in reference case AK-180-42012. And finally, Christopher Vigil. Nine-year-old Christopher Vigil wasn't your average nine-year-old, according to the Missing Christopher Vigil website. Chris, as he was known, was an incredibly curious bookworm who wanted to know everything about the world and how it worked. He was incredibly intelligent and always got straight A's in the school he attended in LaPorte, Colorado. The website was created by a childhood friend of Chris, who also obtained case files from investigators, though not all these pages were released, as they were only given 54 out of the 95 pages of information. Now, while Chris was incredibly intelligent, both academically and emotionally, he was also just like any other kid his age, loved Diet Pepsi and junk food, and would often be seen sharing his food and drink, and sometimes even money with others. So it's safe to say that Chris had an extremely big heart and had time for everyone. At just nine years old, he radiated kindness and curiosity, two things that the world needs at all times. There's no doubt that Chris was special and that he was going to go far in life, but before his potential could ever be realized, it was cruelly taken away from him. Now, over 44 years later, we're left asking, where is Christopher Vigil? On April 30th, 1978, Chris, his mom, and his younger brother were out hiking on Gray Mountain Rock Trail in the Podre Canyon in Podre Park, an area they had never hiked before. Chris's little brother, Eric, was a toddler at the time of his disappearance, so his mother, Marion, had to spend most of her time and energy tending to the little one and helping him along the trail. This slowed the group down, and Chris was eager to get ahead and explore. Marion agreed that Chris could run ahead and that they would meet up further down the trail. When Marion finally got Eric to walk the trail, she found that Chris was not at the agreed meeting spot. Panicked, she called out for her son and attempted to look for him herself. She'd last seen Chris at around 2 to 2.30 p.m., and it wouldn't be until 5.30 p.m. that Marion would officially report her son missing. Within hours, the park was teeming with investigators, scent dogs, search and rescue crews, and helicopter pilots, all gearing up to try and find Chris. As darkness fell, Investigators became even more concerned as the darkness brought chilly temperatures with it. 
when he left his mother to go ahead. Chris was only wearing a green shirt, pants, and a maroon denim jacket, clothes that were not suitable for the outdoors, especially at nighttime temperatures. Throughout the night, the search parties pressed on, and even some of the volunteers got hypothermia as they had severely underestimated how cold it was going to get in the park. Snow and fog rolled in with the morning sun, which did little to help the search efforts. Helicopter pilots furiously studied weather charts, hoping to see that the fog would be clearing soon and that they could continue the search. The adverse weather hampered the search efforts, but the incredible volunteers and authorities pressed on to the best of their ability, determined to find little Chris before it was too late. The days pressed on, and search parties signed in and out, trudging through every inch of the park. While these search efforts continued in the park, investigators made public appeals and released information about Chris and his disappearance, and it wasn't long until some very troubling clues filtered into the police. Alan Chupin came forward to investigators, telling them that he had seen Chris on the trail that day. When Chris had run ahead of his mother, the two had encountered each other, and the two had sat on a large rock and chatted for a bit. According to Alan, Chris was in good spirits, and the two shared some food while Chris asked him questions about the park and the trails. At one point, Chris asked Alan where a particular unmarked trail led to, but Alan didn't know the answer. After the two had spent a small amount of time together, Alan offered to walk Chris back to his mother, figuring that she would be worried and anxious by now. But bizarrely, according to Alan, Christopher said, no thank you, and carried on running down the trail. This account is, of course, from Alan, and while there is no evidence to connect him to the case, it is important to take these witness accounts with a pinch of salt. Alan wasn't the only person to see Chris that day, apparently. Two women, who have only been identified as Carol and Rebecca, would tell investigators they saw Chris on the same trail as they, and he asked the women whether they had seen the man, meaning Alan. Rebecca and Carol instantly assumed that Alan was Chris' father or family member and pointed in the direction he had just gone. This is only the beginning of the account from Carol and Rebecca, and the next two statements are shocking. Rebecca and Carol both remembered seeing a man with dark hair and a straw cowboy hat sitting on a rock near where Chris was. The man was carrying a camera around his neck, and they found it odd that he was sitting so close to Chris. The two women carried on further up the trail and found a spot to sit and eat their lunch. Just as they were taking their first bite, they heard two people shouting. One sounded like a young boy and the other an older man. The shouting carried on for a few minutes, but Rebecca and Carol did not investigate as they were worried for their own safety. Two women added that they had wanted to investigate but were too scared. Minutes later, the shouting had subsided and the two breathed a sigh of relief. They continued on eating before packing up their leftovers and boxes and preparing to carry on with the rest of the trail. It wasn't until they walked past the same rock that they had seen the strange mount on that they realized that something was amiss. On the ground, they saw a can of Diet Pepsi and remembered that Chris had been carrying a can when they saw him earlier. Diet Pepsi was also his favorite drink. All these details were relayed to investigators. Now the picture was becoming a little more clear, perhaps. But who was this mysterious man? Unfortunately, no forensic evidence was obtained from the can, as one of the women picked it up to discard later. Police began combing through the women's stories and were certain that the mysterious man they heard Chris arguing with was not Alan Chupin. Alan also stated to investigators that the man heard with Chris was not him. Alan also had blonde hair, while this mysterious man had dark hair. With so many questions, but very few answers, investigators continued through the park, but to no avail. After just six days, the search for Chris was officially called off due to adverse weather conditions. Chris' family and those closest to him were understandably devastated, but vowed to never give up looking for the little boy. Carol and Rebecca would later tell investigators that they remembered seeing a white Volvo station wagon and a light green car in the parking lot of the Gray Rock Mountain Trail that day, but they were unable to recall any license plate numbers or any other distinguishing factors. Even professional scent dogs were not able to find any trace of Chris, leading most to believe that he was likely kidnapped by the mysterious man at the rocks that day. Alan Chupin was ruled out by investigators, which means that another man must have been stalking the trails that day. Was this a crime of opportunity? Did the man set out that day hoping to come across a young boy on the trail, and Chris just so happened to be the unsuspecting victim? Or did Chris wander off into the great unknown, wearing nothing but a green shirt and a denim jacket? There have been numerous apparent sightings of Chris in Colorado, Wyoming, and Utah, although these sightings have never been confirmed. So for now, Chris' disappearance remains unsolved, 
and his remaining family members and friends are the driving force behind keeping his name in the media and keeping his case alive. Christopher William Vigil was last seen on April 14, 1978 on the Gray Rock Mountain Trail in Podre Park, Colorado. He is described as a white male with brown hair, green eyes, stood 4 foot 8 inches tall and weighed 74 pounds. He was last seen wearing a dark green knit shirt, green plaid pants, white socks, blue tennis shoes, and a maroon or purple denim jacket. Anyone with any information is asked to please contact John Fan of the Larimer County Sheriff's Office at 970-498-7000 and reference case number 7827. Well, friends, there you have it. What do you think of these unusual disappearances? I look forward to reading your comments, but please remember to keep it friendly and respectful. If you'd like to see more videos like this, check out the playlist that we have here. These playlists showcase our best content and have videos that many of you may have never seen before. So check them out. See what you might have missed out on. Until we meet again, be good to yourselves and each other. I'm Steve Stockton. And I'll see you a little further on down the trail. Tell your pets I said hi.